All right, welcome to part two of our regression series, where we're gonna get into the specific issues with data screening in regression. So what we did at the very beginning of the semester, or I guess halfway through the semester, who knows at this point, right? Is we looked at a fake regression to get the information we needed for our data screening. But now we're running real regression, so we don't gotta fake anything. So we're going to add just a, a little bit of nuance to the steps we ran before, looking more specifically at <clears throat> predicting actual Y instead of predicting a random Y. So we wanna look at our residuals specifically for Y while screening X. Now you can still do the old steps. They'll work just fine. They should give you the same answer. However, you can't use the new version of outliers we're gonna talk about unless you do this new set of steps. And that makes it sound like it's really different. It's really not. <laughs> it's very similar to what we've done before, but we don't need a fake regression because we're running real regression now. And so we used a random variable before to check our <clears throat> continuous variables to make sure that they were, you know, uh, I not randomly distributed, but the, the error terms were were normal and um, on the scatter plot, they were a bunch of random dots, right? Now we don't need that random variable because the residuals for Y should be um, evenly and randomly distributed with X, okay? Now, when I say randomly distributed, I mean, they're, they're all very close to zero, right? Our, our nice normal distribution of residuals and there's no pattern to the to the distribution of the residuals. So this is heter the heteroscedasticity question, right? And so if you're like, oh gosh, I forgot what she meant by the term. That's okay, we'll look at plot here in a minute. <clears throat> so you would always wanna check for accuracy. That's true of any analysis, cause garbage in, garbage out. Check for our missing data, see if we can do anything about it. But with only a couple of predictors, probably not because you can't fill in that much data. Outliers are somewhat new and exciting. So we're gonna to add to our Mahalanobis that we were doing before. Additivity, excuse me, or multicollinearity, if you have more than one predictor. Linearity, cause this is linear regression, normality all the time. Um, homogeneity and mostly homoscedasticity cause there's homoscedasticity becomes a bigger problem with this type of analysis. So let's look at an example here, right? And so we've got a data set that covers mental health and drug use. So we have a score for people's depression using a very famous scale called the CESD. The purpose in life score, which is a measure of meaning in life, how purposeful, how meaning driven their life is. The audit, which is a measure of alcohol use and the DAST, which is a measure of drug use. So I've imported that data here with Rio and I have just um, grabbed the columns we're gonna use for this example. Okay, so there are other variables in this data set but I just grabbed the ones we're gonna look at. So we've got the four, PIL, CSD, AUDA, and DAST. All of these are continuous variables then, you know, otherwise this looks pretty good. So let's see, for accuracy, what I'd wanna do is using my summary, just check the min and max values. I clearly have a one in A across the entire data set for some reason. And I will tell you that these are accurate because I've looked at this data a thousand times, but you would have to know what values you should expect here. And we only have one missing data point because with four columns, we can't really estimate missing data. So I just say, you know what, in A omit, and now I'm left with 266 after I eliminate the data point columns to work, or participants to work with, which should be pretty good. Okay, it's a larger sample. Now, I mostly kind of didn't do a whole lot in, in those sections. I didn't mess up the data because I wanna spend most of my time here focusing on outliers. In this section, we're gonna add two new outlier checks um, that are specific to regression. And I will tell you that there is no 
set one set of rules here. There are many other ways to check for outliers in regression that are variations on this theme. These are some of the more common ways. And you can change your criteria based on more your goals for your analysis. So I'm going to give you a good suggestion here with the caveat that once you're on your own, uh, it, this is not like the answer. <laughs> So we'll stick with Mahalanobis because it's a good multivariate measure of, of outlierness, right? So people, how far away they are from the mean of all the means. We're gonna add to that what are called leverage scores and Cook's distance. Okay. And if you're reading the chapter, the Andy Field chapter on this, there are a lot more. It's just, I think these, these three combined give you a really good feel for what type of outlier someone can be, because right? they can be very far away from the mean of the means, but not cause you any other problems. So they're in line with your prediction. They could be very far away from everyone else and be causing a lot of problems because their data point is what's um, got, called, got a lot of leverage, meaning they're way away from everyone else. And the funny story behind this is that I was looking at a plot of fantasy football scores <laughs> from a couple of years ago and looking at all the dots and apparently Christian McCaffrey <laughs> is the outlier, right? So if you're trying to put regression lines on some of those, those statistics a couple of years ago, he was the problem <laughs> on plotting and predicting the analysis. So you can have outliers like that, people who score a lot of points who, um, uh, screw up the analysis. <laughs> and we'll talk about what we mean by that in a second. Okay. And so we could, ex you know, consider multiple checks for excluding outliers. And what we'll do here is, is uh, two strikes, you're out. So to make another sports example. But the idea here is that each one of these individually may be a bit sensitive. Okay. And so I could say if they're a Mahalanobis outlier, they're out. And then if they're, uh, if they're not an outlier and they have cooks and leverage, they're out. So they're kind of different combinations you can make here. My goal with this is to say, okay, I have three different criteria. If you meet two of those three criteria, I'm gonna kick you out of my analysis. But you could say you have to meet all three. You could say you have to meet only one of them. You could say, well, for this one, I want to kick everyone out. But for the other ones, they have to have at least two. So there's a lot of ways to think about this. So you have to remember what each of these numbers represents. So let's start with Mahalanobis. Okay. This is a function that we've used previously. We use it in the same exact way. Okay. Um, but what I'm gonna do is simply add a column um, or a create a variable, not a new column, but create a variable that holds on to uh, sort of true false style if they're an outlier. Okay. And our little table that we'll create of this will tell us if they are an outlier or not. Okay. So let's look at that in action. So Mahalanobis, you put in the name of your data frame, which is only our four columns. Again, the name of the data frame and covariance matrix, the name of the data frame. Okay. I know I don't have any outliers, so I don't have to worry about the outlier or the um, backup. I know I don't have any missing data, so we don't have to worry about any of the missing issues here. We're going to create our cutoff score, right, which is based on our chi-square distribution with our p-value 0.001. Remember, this is the, the, the hypothesis testing for uh, uh, data screening where we want to use a really strict rule. So this creates outliers who are less than 1% uh, of the data where the degrees of freedom are the number, of call, the number of variables that went into that analysis. And normally we'd compare their actual Mahalanobis score and we, to the cutoff score, which is what we're doing here. Okay, so I'm gonna say, tell, keep track, bad Mahal, <laughs> here of how, if their score is greater than the cutoff. Okay, so make it numeric though, because we're gonna add these up. And so if their score is greater than the cutoff, they get a one. And the one indicates here that they're an outlier. So we have 261 that don't have bad Mahalanoba scores and five that do. Cool. 
Let's do that twice more, but now for the other two criteria. Okay. And so the first one we're gonna, uh, first thing we have to do is actually run our analysis okay. because it's going to base the uh, criteria, the outlierness is based on the actual DV and other predictors in the equation. So with Mahalanobis, it's just calculating in the middle, how far away in multi-D space they are from the middle of the middle. This actually considers the other predictors and which one is Y. Okay. And so we will build our regression equation first and then calculate the outliers based on that equation. So to do that, what we'll do is Y is approximated by X plus X plus X. Okay. So these are the column names in our data frame. And we put Y first. I don't need to put the name of the data set first, although you could do no miss dollar sign CESD, no miss dollar sign pill, but it has a data argument, so we don't have to. So we do CSD is approximated by, this is the tilde on the keyboard, which on my QWERTY keyboard is above the tab. And then we just do X plus X plus X. So this is just like our equation we were talking about in the last video. And the way you read this is Y is approximated by these variables. Okay, so we're predicting their depression scores with their meaning in life, expect positive values, right? Their uh, drugs and alcohol use, maybe expect negative scores there. Where as alcohol use goes up, depression scores actually both, they go up. So those would be positive, but as meaning goes up, depression goes down, so that would be negative. I just call it model one, you can call it whatever you'd like out here, um, but we're gonna save that output. So we're not looking at the analysis yet because this isn't our, our statistical test. This is our test for outliers. So leverage, what is leverage? Leverage is the influence of that data point on the slope. So the way I think about leverage, is like you're jacking up your car. So you've got a flat tire and you gotta jack up your car, right? So you put the jack underneath and you get the leverage on this heavy car by like pushing the lever up and down. So a, a, a participant score a data point that has leverage okay, changes the slope because what happens is the slope is pulled towards an outlier. So let's say this is the regression equation without Christian McCaffrey. Because he scores so high, he pulls the data up towards him. That makes the residuals or the error terms for everybody else who's down here higher because you're trying to account for the fact that this one point is way out here in space. And so the scores that you'll get, sometimes these are called hat values, um, from R, whatever, is the change in slope. So the slope for B with all of the regression of the data points for that predictor, well, for, for all of them, okay, it's kind of average, but the slopes, right? Um, <coughs> excuse me. The slopes with that per data point minus the slopes without that data point. So this is very like a kind of a simple idea of like, it's called a leave one out principle, right? So we leave this person out and we see how much the slopes change without them. If the slopes don't really change very much, they're not influencing that slope, meaning they're just in line with everybody else. If the slopes change a lot, that means that they, that one point has a lot of leverage or a lot of control over the slope. Okay. So much like politics, so you're trying to figure out which data point is, is the one that has all the power. And in a good model, no one data point would do this, okay? Because the model would represent everyone kind of equally. Okay. But we have to have a kind of a score for what is bad. Okay. And some very smart people have suggested 2K plus two over N. Okay. This is from the Cohen, Cohen, Aiken and West textbook. Okay. Where K here is the number of predictors and is the sample size. Okay. So a slope is influential if once we do all this math, they have a higher leverage score, our data point is influential. They have a higher leverage score than this sort of um, criteria for a cutoff. 
So let's see. So I've just told it, okay, here's K, because we're going to use K a couple times. To get the leverage values, we use this hat values function on our saved model output. I'm going to calculate my cutoff score as 2K plus 2 divided by the number of rows in my data set. This does assume there's no missing values. And we're just going to say, okay, there uh, uh, outlier if the leverage, their leverage score, their influence over the slope is greater than the cutoff score. Okay, just like we did a minute ago from a holonobus. Now look at how many more people I thought was bad. Okay. So it's now telling me that 31 data points have high leverage. And this is one reason I use the two strikes are out rule because I sometimes feel like this leverage um, score is a little sensitive, okay, to, I don't know what, <laughs> to sample size, to, it's not unusual to get a lot of them for leverage. And, you know, maybe I don't totally want to just eliminate everyone who changes my slope. Okay. So maybe I could combine this with Mahalanobis. Go, well, your scores are way out of Mars and you have a lot of influence. And let's have one more popular measure here, okay, which is Cook's distance. So Cook's is actually a measure of influence as well, um, but it's meant to represent both leverage and discrepancy. So we just talked about leverage, but um, discrepancy is how far that data point is away from everyone else. So it, it measures the Christian McCaffrey-ness, if you will. <laughs> so it measures how far away from, like if all of my dots are down here, it measures how far away they are. Because I can have a data point that is way far away from everyone, but in line with the equation. I can also have data points that are way far away from everyone and way up here. So this is meant to capture a little bit of both. Okay. And it's, it measures the kind of influence on the entire model, not just the slope. So it's kind of a measure of the difference in the residuals. Okay. It's the same leave one out principle, calculates the score with, score without. And the cutoff score for this is four divided by degrees of freedom. So N minus K minus one. All right, so to get that, we do cooks.distance on our mo saved model. We calculate our cutoff score. This is why I saved K, so I can use it a couple times. Ooh, that says in row. That is not correct right there. Let's fix that real quick. And this should be on our no miss data set. That might change our results. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Now that you've seen the slides yet, uh, da -da, Cooks. Okay. <clears throat> All right, we talked about what Cooks is. So this calculates um, now correct this time on the data set we've been using for the model. Okay, minus k minus one. Calculate if uh, their actual Cook score is different than our cutoff. So for the cutoff, I put cut in front of each one so I can remember that this is the cutoff score. And you see that this one's sort of in the middle of the two. Okay, we have 15 bad points. Now, combine these two, to, these three together. So I'm gonna create a total score for the number of indicators a data point has. And that's easy, I just add them up. Bad Mahalanobis plus bad leverage plus bad cooks. Gives me my total outlier score. And you can decide what rule you want to use here and how, how you want to use it. Like exclude all my holonobis and then everybody who's both cooks and leverage is a totally valid way to do this. But I'm going to use the two strikes you're out rule. And that leaves me with 11 data points that would be considered outliers. So three, I'm sorry, two data points have all three of them. Nine data points have two of them. So I'm not really particular about which ones they have, but this would allow me to get rid of, this allows me to say, if any one of these is too sensitive, I've done at least two of them. <laughs> okay, so two strikes are out. So to do that, I'm gonna, oh, good grief, this is wrong too. I hope this does not continue to be incorrect. Great thing about Markdown, let me promote the, the love of Markdown <laughs> that I can fix this real quick. 
right? Make sure you're using the right data set the whole time. Okay, so we're on no miss here. So we're subsetting out our no miss data set and saying anything less than two. Now, the difference between no miss and no ma and our master data set is one data point, but I should still be using the right data set here. It's our no out data set. Cool. Now, what next? So we've changed outliers and we could now run through the rest of the assumptions. We're going to run that on our real regression. However, we've gotten rid of 11 data points that influence our model. So you want to run your regression, same regression, again, on the right data, <laughs> and just call it like model two or something. So you don't want to run your assumptions on the data model that used the outliers. Okay, so our model one included those 11 points that we've eliminated. So now model two here excludes those points. So we can check our assumptions excluding people we know might cause crazy residuals or um, be really far out on our scatter plot. Now this is all the same. Okay. For additivity, we could calculate the correlations directly, but no need to reinvent um, the wheel and no need to run things that I don't have to because it's already part of the output from regression. So you do want X and Y to be correlated. So I don't want to look at that um, and get confused because it's easy for me. I get confused a lot um, about, oh, I have to exclude this variable because it's highly correlated and later I'll be like, duh. Okay, I do want X and Y to be correlated. And if that, that highly correlated, uh, well, probably something's wrong, but that would be good, right? I've got a perfect predictor. But you don't want the X's to be correlated because you'll lose power. So a quick way to get that is to run a summary and say, cool, give me the correlations. And I'm gonna try my best to ignore the tables and all the interesting stuff that actually tells me if my hypothesis worked, come down here to the bottom. Don't look at this intercept um, point here, but look at this out here. Okay. The pill total correlated with the audit total, very low. Pill total, DAST, also low. Audit and the DAST are correlated, but not be, uh, beyond our are scary scores. Okay. Now in a regression analysis, a correlation of about 0.7 might start to give you problems, but 0.9 is still our rule. Next, we can use that same code, but now it's not a fake regression. We're just going to do some model two. So create our standardized or studentized residuals and create our fitted scores. And then let's just start looking at them. So I'm going to look at linearity here okay, between two and two, pretty close. We're starting to bend away over here, but it's pretty close in line. Okay. Remember, be nice to these plots. I would say this is fairly linear. Our histogram, now this is not a random variable. So no matter how many times you run this, you'll get the same picture. <laughs> So that is a little different from before where we might run it a couple times just to make sure it's not one crazy random run. But this, you know, between two and two, it's pretty, it's a little, mostly centered over zero. So it's, it's pretty normal. We have a large sample size, but we do have a little bit of positive skew okay? where it's shifted to the left of zero just a bit. And it does have this tail. So I have a little bit of skew. Um, re uh, regression is fairly robust to this problem and we have a large sample. So the distribution, uh, the sampling distribution should be okay. Now, the more important one I would definitely say is homoscedasticity. Okay. Well, let's look at both. So a little bit of issues with some homogeneity. Now, homogeneity is traditionally interpreted as uh, equal variances between groups, right? But what we can see is the variance here is not exactly equal around zero. So we might have some issues with homogeneity between variables at least, All right? So it goes from two to four here. So that's not quite an even spread around zero. But homoscedasticity is actually okay. Now, there is uh, there are more dots here, but I think in general, when I draw kind of my square around the dots, it's pretty even. So we might be, you know, we might have starting to see some issues where uh, the prediction here is a little different than the prediction over here, but it's not terrible. Okay. So my quick glance, 
draw a square around it. Looks pretty even down all the values of x and y. So we'll say it's uh, good enough for government work. Okay. <clears throat> Now, some alternatives that you could use, right? If something goes wrong, if it's a linearity problem, you can try nonlinear or non-parametric regression. Okay? And so you can think, you can start to start modeling curvilinear regression or power functions. If it's normality and you can get more subjects, get more subjects, but it is fairly robust with larger sample sizes. And if it's, got problems with homoscedasticity or the problem is heteroscedasticity bootstrapping will at least give you um, standard errors that are more representative and you can sort of feel better <laughs> about your statistical tests. So most people look for um, they're called heteroscedastic consistent standard errors where we've kind of bootstrapped what the what the number should be. Well, we won't talk about bootstrapping in this lecture, but next week we'll show you how to do bootstrapping so that you can extrapolate that back. So this is where we're going to take a brief pause and keep these videos from being too long. So come back to see if our models have worked.